Oh, you're such an obedient crowd. You got quiet right away. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Frank Matero. I'm chair of the Department of Historic Preservation. Uh, welcome to our third of four uh, open panel discussions on uh, preservation futures. Uh, the first was on society, the second on history. This is the third on design and our fourth and last uh, and I and I didn't prepare to give you the date of that. I think it's in a few weeks. Is on science. So um, each of these four uh, topics look at the intersection of those topics and the meaning of historic preservation. And it comes at a time when the department, in its forty third year, um, is looking to see what the future holds. Um, with that, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, David Hollenberg, who will be. Uh, leading the charge today with the panelists. He will introduce them. Uh, David is no stranger to, I suspect, all of you. Um, he's on faculty here and has been for many years uh, on the preservation faculty here at Penn. And he's also, uh, for over a decade, he was the um, campus architect here at Penn. So David, with that, I'll let you take full advantage of the time. And Nate, your co-moderator, nobody tells me anything. Uh, sorry, Nate. Uh, Nate, who also teaches in the program, um, a very important course on uh, preservation in historic settings. So, gentlemen, who's going first? Okay. Thanks, Frank. Is this working? Yes. Hi. Good, good. So, first of all, I want to wish everybody a happy Leap Day. This, uh, I don't know if that's ominous or, in, and if so, in what way, but happy Leap Day. Um, today, Nate and I are delighted to moderate a panel discussion among design professionals with different personal and professional experiences regarding the particular challenges of designing within the existing built environment. Each of these professionals has demonstrated in their work uh, a deep but not always unquestioning level of respect for what exists. These are not people who hesitate to question what's out there. And they have a deep obligate, recognize the deep obligations to designing in the context of that very respect. Each of them identifies quite differently with the notion of preservation design, which I put in quotes, which is our subject today. Uh, you can find uh, the bios of these distinguished guests in the event website, but we're very happy to welcome Dominique Hawkins, who is the uh, FAIA founder and uh, principle of Preservation Design Partnership, which is I, I just learned yesterday is coming up on its 30th anniversary, which blows my mind. Uh, Steve Kieran, uh, no, not a stranger to, I think, any of you, uh, FAIA founder and principal of Kieran Timberlake Architects here in Philadelphia, and Peter Bitteretto, a landscape architect, FASLA of Heritage Landscapes, uh, partner at, at Heritage Landscapes. We're really fortunate to have them. Uh, the moderators, such as it will be, if we can sort of wrangle this, these three, uh, are uh, uh, myself and Nate. We'll do our best to go through a series of questions. And both Nate and I, as Frank mentioned, uh, serve on the faculty here in the Department of Historic Preservation. Uh, this roundtable is essentially about historic preservation's most visible form of engagement with the public. That is that which is made physical through design. Within the field of historic preservation, design is a key component, perhaps the key component in managing change in the actual built environment. Design is the way in which historical settings are adopted to contemporary needs, interpretations, value systems, uh, and open, sites that are both recognized and overlooked and underestimated. So uh, what, what we might call preservation design, which I think is our term of art today, is an evidently creative endeavor and and really an activity, uh, which I think we argue uh, has an accumulated set of instincts and codified practices, uh, which have been drawn heavily from, from traditionally defined historic settings. <clears throat> but of course, the way we define what is historic uh, is, is always changing. And so set against the backdrop of of this evolving understanding of both history and the historic, uh, we have we have sort of a set of big general questions. We'll get into the specific questions in a minute, but the questions that that we asked ourselves in the panel um, is: Is there a difference between design and preservation design? With extraordinary pressure on our built environments and landscapes from really all directions, 
what role should preservation design play in preserving our built heritage? Um, are preservation design practices evolving at all? And if so, is it fast enough to remain relevant to today's challenges? Um, how do new approaches to historic evaluation methods and community engagement impact the design professions? <clears throat> and really, how effective are established modes of intervention when applied to buildings, neighborhoods, landscapes, and open spaces that derive significance for reasons not immediately evident in their physical form? And with a backdrop of every kind of crisis now, right, large-scale climate crisis, uh, resource, biodiversity, uh, affordable housing, how do we square the value systems underpinning sustainable design with those of historic preservation, given, uh, as we all know, that those are sometimes in harmony, but also sometimes competing. So we're really fortunate uh, to be able to engage today in a conversation on such questions uh, with these three nationally recognized design professionals. And we hope our conversation will shed light on both their personal approaches to these issues and those of the firms they lead uh, with dare we say it, because it's in the title of the event, maybe some prognostication or prediction for the future um, for where the intersection of historic preservation and design is headed. So I'll pass it back to David for the first question. Okay, uh, everybody with us? Here we go. Fashion your seat belts. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the uh, first two sessions, uh, those of you who had the pleasure of attending the first two sessions uh, uh, will remember that and recognize that um, Storytelling was an essential component of the analysis in both of those sessions. So I want to start today by asking our panelists to do a little of their own storytelling. And the question to them, which is not a surprise, they know this question, which is to uh, tell us all a, a story about uh, the something that's happened in their personal or professional life that raised conundrums about preservation and design uh, that are uh, in some ways perhaps inextricable, but that might shed light uh, on the conversation today. And uh, the corollary to that is, can you trace an arc uh, of development of your, both yourself and the firms you lead? Uh, and does that arc in any way suggest the future of preservation design? So do I call on someone or is someone gonna volunteer? <laughs> I guess I, I'm, I'm, I'm calling on Dominique. Um, so I have a dual degree major from Penn. I got both an architecture and a preservation degree in 92. While I was getting those degrees, I happened to be working for David Hollenberg. So I, I was working um, on some pretty incredible buildings in Philadelphia of a large scale um, um, while I was getting my degree and stayed a couple of years in the firm afterwards. I started my own firm three years after graduating from Penn. Monumental buildings as a sole practitioner are really hard to get. So I fell into, um, I started doing preservation design uh, planning work. And in the course of the last 30 years, the shift in what preservation planning means on the ground has changed dramatically. I will let others speak to buildings and landscapes. So this is why I'm taking planning. <laughs> so so it, over the course of 30 years, we went from telling you know, we used to we used to do surveys and and look at historic districts and what are the qualities of these places based upon a it's it meets a certain architectural style. It is built built of a certain period. Washington slept there. He didn't sleep there. Whatever it might be, but there <laughs> he never slept actually. Um, but now the questions are really looking at why does this place matter to the people who are there. Who's in the room having those conversations? What are the impacts of, of the environment around them and coming to climate change, et cetera? How are those forcing changes? Some people are more willing to accept change than others. And who in the ultimately makes a decision about what's important? And the going from an academic look at this building was built in a certain age, designed by a certain architect in a certain style, it's much more about the conversation. This place matters to me because, and that's an extreme shift. And understanding that these the people who live in these places also appreciate the threats that they are are seeing, be it environmental, economic, you know, gentrification. Take whatever word you want. They want to be part of the decision making process moving forward. So that's that's the big shift for me. As a very young firm, we were able to get that project. So. Um, we um, added a into the dining hall, one of the historic rooms, we proposed adding a balcony in there. 
we had a lot of reasons for doing it um, to enhance fundamentally the use of the building. Um, and uh, it was met with extreme resistance at a kind of university wide presentation on all the projects they were doing. There were, there were protests um, about it. And I, I was still a relatively young architect and, you know, but um, used to, uh, you know, confrontations in the design world. That's part of the, the process of design um, and a good part of it typically. But it caught me by surprise a bit, frankly. And um, um, on the opposite end of this, the parallel story is for a project we're just finishing now for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. For those of you that don't know the building, it's next to the Library of Congress, cat a corner to the across the street from the Supreme Court, very prominent location. Um, uh, but once again, you know, almost 30 years later, I found myself um, confronted with a lot of resistance to change and addition in um, that historic context. And um, um, in both instances, the changes were about our insistence that the best way to truly keep these buildings for the future is to make them as useful as they can possibly be for the present and what little we can see of the future. And that's probably the underlying belief of our practice when it comes to um, buildings that already exist, historic and otherwise, and we do work in some that are way less historic than these two. Um, is that if we don't make them as useful, as accessible, both physically and also emotionally accessible as they can possibly be, we are putting those buildings at risk for the future. And there are very, very few buildings in the world um, that can ever be kept in any condition that remotely resembles their originating state and we can't afford them in general when we don't use our buildings robustly they're in danger of falling into disuse and with disuse comes a lack of care and stewardship so our position is pretty assertive about it and these two additions and the confrontations over them the second one by the way we had to go through the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts, the D.C. Historic Preservation Commission, and a whole fleet of other reviewing authorities. We started on it 10 years ago. It's just finishing today. So, um, but um, in both instances, I found the reviewing authorities who identified as, quote, preservationists, um, not sympathetic um, fundamentally to the degree of change that we felt was necessary to really secure the futures of both of these buildings. And um, so that, that's the story I'm reflecting on because you know one is quite a while ago, another uh, unfolding today, the Folger is gonna be dedicated and opened this spring. But um, to me, little has changed on that front. Um, there's still, particularly in our most historic settings, um, you know, a sense that um, uh, the job of those um, either citizens or professionals, it's usually combinations of both, charged with conserving our past, my term, not theirs, theirs would be preserving it, um, uh, really feel um, very, very hesitant about additions and significant alterations in historic settings. And, uh, that's a uniquely American position, I believe. Um, uh, there's much less discomfort in much older cultures um, like the UK and Europe um, with significant change to historic settings. And, uh, um, but it still remains problematic here. And I think it really puts many of our most important architectural heritage sites at risk.
And I'll follow with that. I mean, Steve is correct that most of our historic landscapes are at risk. And Heritage Landscapes has the fortune of working on uh, some of our most iconic landscapes that have fallen in disrepair, they're in decline, and they need the support of the public, you know, uh, conservation commissions to sort of keep them going. Um, you know, one of these projects we've worked on is Jackson Park in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we were brought on board to sort of design the D word uh, and working with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, to sort of repurpose and re reinvigorate the natural landscape in the Gleefer project, the Great Lakes Fisheries and Ecological Restoration Project, to replant over 38 acres in a, bio, in a biodiverse setting while still maintaining and being able to um, sort of restore the Olmsteadian uh, design motif and design platform for the park. Uh, Jackson Park is the home of the 1893 Chicago Ex Ex Exposition. It's been redesigned three times. It had fallen into disrepair through the 1960s. We've seen missile sites uh, located in that park. We lost the South Lagoon as sort of a retrofit to be able to give public back their space. But the park had become compartmentalized over a number of years, and the users would dr drive into the park, park go away. So our job as Heritage Landscapes was to take the Olmsted design and repurpose it using this ecological planting of over 1 million plugs, 1,500 trees, and over 38 acres, so that the park could have the recreate and have the style and the character of an Olmsted landscape. And it's, it's quite a challenge because you're up against the neighborhood committees. You have to go and you have to sort of talk with everyone and build consensus. And then still, because of it being on the National Register, we had to pass the SHPO reviews. But it was a very rewarding park, a lot of, a lot of project, a lot of interesting questions came up. I mean, a conundrum is when you're out there laying out, you know, walkways on February 7th at seven degrees below zero, and you're trying to recreate an Olmsted landscape, well knowing what it is, but you've got five people behind you saying, why don't you get this done? And you know, you're sitting there with this preservation uh, idea and conservation that, that, that the Olmsted landscape is important. How do you get it on the ground? How do you put preservation in play? And why is it important? And Dominique and I talked about this a little bit last night is that the, the guys on the ground with me, you know, they're getting impatient because I can't quite figure this out. So you look at them and you say, you realize you're doing something that's going to last another hundred years. You know, so it's not just about you. It's about what came before you. It's what you're doing now and where this park is going. So, I mean, the while though preservation, you know, it's become more mainstream in the last 15 years that I've been involved with it. It's actually very valuable that it has become more mainstream, you know, and we're fortunate to be able to do this. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stick with you, Peter, okay, for the next question. And this also builds on the most recent session. I think had you been here uh, last month for the, for the history session, I think you would have really been fascinated by a thread that was woven through it by the, all the participants, but especially by Dr. Farmer, Dr. Jared Farmer, and his recognition of the coincidence of the National Historic Preservation Act and the Endangered Species Act being very near in time to each other, and his his notion of uh, models of ecosystems and how that might apply uh, to preservation, thinking about preservation in general and preservation planning in specific. And it was a really rich, I think, thread of that last session. And I think it's very pertinent to landscape design. It, to be a landscape designer, you have to be humble because you're your main partners are nature and time, and they don't necessarily listen to what you tell them to do. Um, and and so I'm I'm curious, uh, uh, your reflect because you work a lot with other with architects who may not have the same humility that landscape architects are required <laughs> to have. Uh, <laughs> you can't really, you can't not. And, and I'm curious about uh, if you have any reactions to that sort of perspective on the sort of ecosystem approach to thinking about. The nature of the work that is the subject of this panel. Perhaps there are, there are two levels I think about it, and I'm bringing it down to a ground plane. Uh, you know, when we're working on landscape, the the ecology, the ecosystem, landscape is dynamic; it always changes, and we're always aware of what, what it is as a landscape architect. So that's our first hat. You know, you know, if I look at Panther Hollow at the Shenley Park in Pittsburgh, it's it's an ecological system. It's, it's it, it has bio change, but it has a lot of influence from the drainage systems around it that have become much more influential. 
Now, with the preservation end of this, is that is a designed landscape. How do you accommodate the change and the, the diversity and, and the impact of climate change in this location without losing the preservation heritage of the people who use the park? So that's sort of a mainstream in public parks and the Olmstead landscapes are extremely you know, cognizant of this, this ecology and this, this biosystems. If I take it from Jared's discussion of, and I use street trees as an example. Now this is a slightly different way of thinking about a biosystem. Um, you know, and I'm going to jump to green infrastructure, because if I talk to, to the populace in Norwalk, Connecticut about a biosystem for trees, it's gonna, not going to work. If I start talking about green infrastructure with the engineers start to understand uh, is something that they might be able to wrap their head around very seldom, that in order to get street trees, you need a, you need a system below grade. And it's about soils, about creating a biosystem to support the landscapes that we're trying to recreate. I can talk about that in green streets initiatives. I can talk about it as good streetscape design, but as a preservationist, I can go back and say, but in 1898, this is a late 19th century city. This was a valued landscape. And I add that extra layer of cultural values to a street that they may not have seen before. So all of a sudden I have another tool of preservation that says, this is more important for these reasons, you know, and let that develop in that direction. You know, so it is important to think about it that way. So I think this next question is for, is actually both for Dominique and Steve, and um, it, you may have guessed the pan. We have gotten it together before this event, so we've been we've been thinking about you know what this discussion looks like, and um, Steve, I think you define yourself uh, as a potential conservationist, but not a preservationist, and Dominique, uh, I think you self-identify as a preservation architect, and uh, David and I are curious what these terms mean to you in your own work and 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 sort of how you see yourselves maybe can i add that part of that curiosity is we know you two work together a lot on projects <laughs> and that you're not really from different planets you may have different astrological signs but but other than that um you clearly work very well together uh, despite very different levels of self-identification with respect to this topic today and could you just talk about your roles and how you see what each of you brings to the successful resolution of projects and what inferences one could draw for future forms of practice from that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah you start, Dominic. You're the you're the sub consultant. <laughs> I always take direction well. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we do work together on projects, and we have very clearly defined roles. But I think what actually makes the partnership successful, or the 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 um, the work partnership successful, is that we each know we bring something to the table and we can talk about it and and explain our points of view and there's a respectful dialogue in terms of the value system that we want to promote forward in the project so as a preservation architect i think i i read somewhere that the greatest um compliment for a preservation architect is it looks like you were never there in that you slapped the coat of paint on the wall and walked away. Um, I've had the good fortune to work on extraordinarily monumental and important buildings in Philadelphia and elsewhere where the interventions are quote unquote invisible, but, but we managed to spend $300 million and nobody can tell, <laughs> but the paint's amazing. Um, and I don't, I have never, so there's a lot of science, technology, and understanding building systems and all this other stuff that happens behind the scenes to make that possible. I have never, as a preservation architect, felt to leave the PDP stamp on something in the sense that that's a design. My, my responsibility is to the original designer and serving the needs, the current and future needs of the occupants. Um. You know, my view on the relationship between the two words, conservation and preservation, is that I see preservation as nested within, cons within conservation as a tactic. Um, and it's one of many tactics that one can use to give the past a future. And um, uh, it's very, very rare when you look across all of the forces that go to operate or, or that do operate on any existing structure, 
uh, that the whole of the uh, the in you know the uh, historic building we are working on together can be quote preserved and you have to pick and choose the places where that's um, the best tactic but there are other tactics um, involved in it that sometimes involve addition transformation and significant change and it's the art of it is in really understanding what should apply where and it's a very gray zone of judgment um you know to say you're preserving an artifact wholly um is is um a hundred percent um probably a bit um, disingenuous or not possible in most cases there are certainly things that you've got to replace that are so deteriorated you have to replace them so they're actually new um, is that preservation i don't know you know but it's a tactic for allowing an old artifact to you know proceed into the future so i don't see them as competing in any way they're um, supportive of each other and um you know, and the decisions about what to retain and quote preserve are um, judgments that are design judgments, just as surely as what to change and alter to allow a building to go forward is a design judgment. So, what I like about the term conservation is just the simple breadth of it, and it does have embedded in it, at least in the classic um, American sense of the word. Uh, the fact that um, it, it that it has to be used, whatever you're trying to conserve, will be best conserved if it is used. And pretty ancient meeting, you know, in the American um, landscape, Gifford Pinchot was a broadly based conservationist, was still very very friendly with John Muir, considered more of a preservationist. And they didn't see their tactics as necessarily um, antagonistic. They saw them as complementary. Uh, you know, Pinchot created the U.S. Forest Service that uses natural resource. Um, Muir was more instrumental in the foundation of national parks like Yosemite um, that use them less, but still use them for recreational purposes. So um, that that's kind of how I view the relationship between the two not competitive but just there's this broad umbrella of tactics that uh, a conservationist view of the world of um, historic architecture can include that many people don't um, include when they think of it as just preservation Um, I think following up on that, maybe to, to press each, each of you a little bit on the word design, um, which is such an amorphous word. Um, and and whether you think that um, essentially, what is design alone amongst all of the tools in the preservationist toolbox offer historic preservation um, that those other tools don't? And maybe talk a bit about um, whether the 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 kind of inherent quality of design, which has to do with um, uh, creative and intuitive thinking, is maybe a little bit unique compared to some of the other aspects of historic preservation, which can be highly technical, highly scientific, highly objective. I don't know, Dominique, maybe starting with you, if like a, a tough question, but um, you know, is everything is everything inside preservation design, or you know, what is not design, and what is different about design? So I don't think everything inside preservation is design because we have history tracks, we have sociology tracks, we have conservation tracks. So all of those things are different aspects of preservation. And, and preservation in many ways tries to do, as a title, does a lot of different things. I think as you start looking at manipulating space, yes. And and I should have clarified maybe in terms of your practice, is it? In, in terms of our practice, I think design is intrinsic to our practice because our firm is a firm of architects who choose to specialize in preservation. So that distinction, I think, actually is really important because we are trained to think like designers 
like, you know, there's, there's the general GPs of the world, like Steve here, who, you know, <laughs> is a general GP, but I, I, we have chosen to specialize and be, be the surgeon that specifically addresses historic properties. So I think there's design built in. Absolutely. I, I totally second that. I personally don't see any distinction um, between design and preservation. Um, they're all historic artifacts that we work on, everything we do in it. I personally, and I think our firm looks at them as acts of design, including all of the acts that Dominique undertakes. Design is just problem solving. You, you've got a problem, you know, you've got an artifact, a, a heritage building of some sort that you're trying to provide for a future on and how do you best solve that problem and all of those decisions that go into the making of that are acts of design period it's not about aesthetics or science um, about preservation or design it's all about design and good designers i think um, try to account for it all and be as inclusive in the umbrella of what you look at under that act of design as you possibly can, whether it's a scientific, uh, uh, you know, research-based approach. We try to integrate that into the art. And um, the more constraints you bring into design, the more potent um, and robust and resonant your solution is going to be the more you allow in. So I don't see any distinction whatsoever. Hey, Peter, your brow is furrowed. Well, the idea that design, you know, is strictly functional and it is constrained by all the things you plug into design, but it still is an aesthetic quality. I mean, there isn't anything that I think that our firm doesn't touch that does not include design. Whether we're recreating a landscape through a very specific person, a purpose or to specific materials, you know, we still have to usually bring te technical design forward. Materials are not always the same. We've got new new materials to use, have new methodologies. Often we will repurpose a landscape and add things that have never been built in it before, but they were intended. Uh, we do a great deal of steel work. That's not necessarily a historic material for most of our landscapes. So everything we touch has intrinsic nature of design to it. Um, well, I, it I gotta interrupt you. Can I do this? Is this allowed? So encouraged. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, the word design often feels like we use it culturally as an applique. And all I'm saying is that there's no difference between all of the things that um, create the constraints that we design around. And design is just the act of resolving all of the inputs and constraints, whether they're technical scientific, ecological, um, you know, the act of bringing them all together into some new whole is design and that we should not differentiate between art and science, um, that we should be more humanists about it and um, work through the two as though the design is not the applique after everybody else has figured out how it's going to work, how it's going to be built. Oh, no, and, no, it's, it, it's, Art is design. I mean, they're they're in, they're, intri they're they're integral. I, I mean, I'm going to use the word industrial design. I mean, I, I can build anything. I, I like to use the word industrial design because it it takes the trees out of landscape design. You know, a bridge is a very beautiful structure. You can you can build that bridge very functionally, but where's the art in in the, where's the art in the arch? You, you know, so there still is that art. It's they're they're they, they're not separable. So I'm with you in the fact that art is not separable from design, but, you know, and all the constraints bring you to that form, but you still have options on that form, per se. Yeah. And maybe to, to phrase this in a different way, I think I'm curious what your all of your thoughts are on, there's a lot within the preservation field, which is, again, technical, objective, and scientific, but there are a lot of design decisions that have multiple outcomes and solutions, and you're often guided by aesthetic judgments, frankly. Um, and so 
<laughs> and cost. <laughs> and cost. And cost. Yes, and cost, right? We work for clients in the real world and, <laughs> and these are projects. And, um, you know, I don't know if anyone wants to pick up that thread, but it, there's a there's a, a, a tension there that I don't think is often acknowledged, uh, maybe explicitly, that um, under the umbrella of preservation, we're often, we're often making aesthetic design decisions for a, a site in, that's going to live on into the future, as opposed to a recovery of the past. I don't know if that resonates. Can I? So, Steve, you um, talked about design being essentially problem solving. And one problem that's emerging for the field is a recognition of how many properties across the country have been overlooked or underestimated. Uh, uh, and uh, um, the fr you hear the phrase sometimes that these are buildings and landscapes that are, quote, in the middle, that are not the iconic high style masterpiece things of which Dominique has observed in some ways are the easiest problems, uh, um, aesthetically, maybe not technically, but aesthetically, but this sort of vast uh, sort of m set of middle neighborhoods, buildings, landscapes um, is I think a problem for the future, not only of preservation, but also of design in general. And I'm wondering if you see um, your firm evolving to trying to address that huge middle, and if so, how, uh, and what's a, what's a prognostication for future practice uh, dealing with the vast middle? And what does a successful project actually look like uh, uh, re rehabilitating uh, that kind of property or that kind of neighborhood or that kind of landscape? Okay, I can start and we can go back and <laughs> forth a little bit on this one, but, um, uh, I think it's a huge dilemma for the preservation profession. Uh, you've often said, I think, that uh, you, you're a relatively small group. You know, there there aren't that many uh, architects that um, define themselves as preservation architects in the U.S. I don't know what the numbers is. There, we were talking about it last night. Fewer than forty programs in the U.S. Um, of different sorts, some degree granting, some not. So there's not a lot of professionals trained in the realm. And as a result, I think a lot of the work, the vast majority is for um, probably 1% or less of those um, buildings that already exist out there. So you've got um, a, a numbers problem here fundamentally in any given year at the start of the year um, we only add about one percent to new buildings in the united states every year so that means 99 percent of what we're going to have at the end of the year is already here and if you're working and i'm working mostly on the one percent of the the highest of the high in terms of cultural heritage and um then who's doing the other 90, 98%? Who's tending to that? And to me, there's just a vast terrain for the whole um, department that lies ahead to start to help create a framework for the management of um, the 98% in any given year that we're not tending to. And who is? Who's doing it? You know, I, um, Architects are moving into it. Uh, for sure, it's now the dominant, um, you know, last year, 52% of the buildings of U.S. architects were um, for buildings that already exist, doing something to them. And it's been going up over the last several years, every year, from a low in the 30% range um, to over half today. So whether you know, we want to or not, it's the economic engine driving our profession. And a lot of us are starting to move into um, other terrain in there, some of the middle terrain, as you call it. Um, but I don't think there's any broad framework. I don't think our professions, either the general profession I grew up in, in architecture, or the preservation profession, are really geared to think about it and, um, and and to to really consider how to intervene and where to act 
where can we best use our relatively limited resources, you know, to, to make change in the middle. And we've certainly done some buildings that were pretty banal and made something really magical out of them, you know, and uh, honestly, when I reflect back about all the projects we've done there, another little story, um, you can cut me off. I'm Irish. I go on with this stuff, but, but, um, a middle school gymnasium. It reflect that Steve Kieran told me I could cut him off. <laughs> so yeah, it was a it was a middle school gymnasium in Washington D.C. built in the 1950s. Very very banal building, lightly structured, lightly framed, um, and we uh, were doing work for the school and other projects, and we got drawn into an evaluation of that and whether or not it could be converted to a Quaker meeting house and an art center, and. What was the value of it? And half of the school was favoring just ripping it down and moving on. And the other half was a Quaker institution was much more circumspect culturally about it. They culturally just value whatever the past has given us, what we've inherited. So we had to get, we went through a very careful analysis of it and developed a design for it. They weren't sure it would be a compelling meeting house and place to worship in. How do you turn a gym into a church, you know? So, um, you know, but ultimately they said, we're going to save and we're going to do that. We're going to turn it into a place of worship for our whole community to gather every week as they do in silence. And uh, um, it turned out to be probably, you know, my, my personal favorite um, project, um, just because it had no business, according to a, the way a lot of people think about the world, because of its banal origins. No, nobody paid a lot of money for it. Nobody could remember where they even got the money from, you know, so, and turning that into something that was at the end of the day, if I do say so myself, a pretty magical place to worship. I mean, when when you can march 600 middle school kids into a room and they all, without being told, automatically become silent, that's good architecture. So I'm, I'm really, <laughs> really proud of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so I'll just I'll just add to this. So the the one percent that that we get to tend to, that we have the responsibility of tending to, there's the set of rules. You know, the Secretary of the Interior Standards that helps us define and create what the parameters of that project will be. For that ninety eight percent, it's really the community. If an architect is doing their job right, who defines what's valuable about it, and it doesn't have to be beautiful; it just has to be locally important. And being able to spend the time to understand what about a place is important is unfortunately where a lot of, a lot of clients don't spend their energy, um, and the architects aren't necessarily given the bandwidth to do that kind of engagement to leave something meaningful for the people who ultimately will have to engage with that spot. I mean, what I'd like to see personally going ahead for the the whole world that is trying to take care of everything that exists is that, um, well, we probably can't get paid enough to do a lot of work in the 98% that's viable for us to do. I think what we can do is we could create frameworks for how to take care of and steward all of that. And um um, and think through who's taking care of what and how, and how do we conserve as much of this as possible? It's pretty urgent. I mean, the, the compelling fact of embodied energy in these buildings and the fact that it can take 15 to 20 years to, uh, once a building becomes new, to catch up to what they already spent on the embodied energy in it, it's pretty pressing to figure out how to save as much of this and reuse it as possible. So what can we as a profession and as, ed, as an educational institution in the case of this setting do to um, broaden knowledge, skills and awareness and the stewardship framework for the 98%? Mm -hmm. 
So that's actually a great segue because I think we want to um, pivot a little bit and talk about sustainability as one of the uh, sort of key facets that has created new trends in how we think about preservation design. And you know, a bit of history, right? Back during the energy crisis, the 1970s, um, that's really when the preservation community slogan the 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 phrase we all know, right? The greenest building is the one you don't build, which sounds great. Um, but I think we might all agree that the field maybe hasn't walked the walk in the last you know 30, 40 years since then. And I and but that is changing. Um, so maybe uh, each of you, maybe starting with Peter and, and then Dominique and then Steve, talk a bit about how. Uh, present day sustainable design values, whether that's energy efficiency, um, embodied carbon, but also operational carbon, especially when we think about preserving buildings for perpetuity, right? That's our stated goal as preservationists. Operational carbon starts to also uh, really matter. Resiliency, biodiversity, and also natural, natural resource management. I mean, how are those playing a role in your projects and your practice? Maybe Peter. Well, I mean, landscapes that are already built are wonderful because they've already spent the energy to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, so preserving those landscapes is very important. They're already open space. We don't have to get it again. They're already constructed. So inherently preservation is sustainable. Well, the materials we move forward to do that, you know, one of our favorite materials is concrete because it neither evokes a certain period. We're building concrete walks in the 1890s. This is not necessarily a new material. It's not a contemporary material, but it's very sustainable. It's also extremely easy to manage for public properties and it has long-term benefits. It's not asphalt. It doesn't bring biochemicals, nothing toxic to the landscape. So we have a debate between using concrete, which has a high carbon footprint, in a landscape, but we're getting a longevity out of it. So this is kind of a debate of what's sustainable in a landscape long term. And often just because of preservation, we're able to be very subtractive in landscapes. Uh, landscapes we have found over time have been sort of um, imposed upon by various activities, uh, various structures, things that don't necessarily reflect the inherent design landscape or the value of the landscape in the, in, in the community it's in. So we're very subtractive when we're able to provide more open space, more recreational space. We actually provide more of a, a social footprint by being slightly subtracted on the preservation format. We're not creating something new. We're using what we have. And Dominique, maybe a bit about resiliency and how that's having huge impacts on... Okay, so I'm getting pigeonholed, but that's Sorry. okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> so a lot of the work I do in preservation planning at this point is actually looking at the impacts of climate change on historic communities. Historic communities tend to be um, built adjacent to water, um, and they tend to be in vulnerable locations. So, so change is coming. And, and the reluctance for, for local communities to accept change is based upon their perceived level of vulnerability. So if their house is flooding, they're all for it. Um, but if it hasn't come yet, no change, thank you. Mm -hmm. And that, that political tension is really difficult because you're, you're typically dealing with a property owner's highest valued possession, their home and their, their sort of financial stability and their ability to stay in a place that they love. Having said that, there is, there is a disconnect from the reality of what is coming. So what is coming is that the seas are rising, the climate is changing, and there are certain places that will no longer be here. And in your lifetimes, probably, you know, in mine also, but, you know, I'm hedging my bets here. But in your lifetimes, there are going to be certain places that will no longer be here. And in looking at how, you know, what's what's important about that place? Is it the fact that all the houses are really super cute and the main street's lovely? That's probably not true. Once you get down to it, it's really about the people and the stories and the places and the culture that exist there. So as preservationists, do you have an obligation to capture their story before they're all gone? Right? And that's that's actually, in my mind, a huge issue coming forward in looking at how the environmental impacts of places are occurring. Go ahead, follow that. <laughs> All right. Tough one, but I, I don't know. In, in our practice, carbon accounting um, has become a standard for us over the last 15 years or so, and we've developed software to do it market it and now give that software to other architects. Um, but um, we apply it 
to existing buildings. You know, we model the carbon content in those buildings and we apply it to new buildings and we apply it to projects that are both, they're new and um, old. We're working on Morgan Hall right across the street with Dominique and we're putting an addition on it. So we, we model them individually, a new building, the old building, and then together and look at them. And um, we do so during design and try and look at the design decisions we're making about the amount of carbon in the different materials. And um, um, concrete, by the way, is all, always the worst offender. And, of uh, you know, so hey, I admitted, <laughs> but we we look at how we can make other choices that can lower that impact. You know, clearly though, the biggest thing we can do is keeping more structures hands down and not just keeping them, but getting more use into the same space. If it's a residence hall, how can we get more beds in the same space? So getting more utility out of what we already own um, and what's already been built seems to be, to me, to be a huge ethical, um, you know, almost moral question for all of us in this field to really um, get the most out of what we've already got and take care of it. Don't let it um, degrade to the point where we're making decisions about tearing it down and I do believe the change is here. The numbers I cited earlier about how much of our work is now in and around old buildings compared to just two decades ago, there's already been a huge shift and it's it's moving up year by year. And uh, so, you know, there's, there's real progress on it. Uh, what is needed, I think, though, is more currency um, to carbon. We don't yet think of it culturally in the way we think of money. Everybody knows how much money is worth, but we don't have much cultural currency related to carbon. It's a much more abstract um, concept. And professionally, I'm always wondering what more can the professions do to create more sense of currency so people look at it as something that's a resource that they're spending, just like money, and how can they conserve it? So. Maybe yeah, just to follow questions? up to that, yeah. um, Stephen, to you, um, um, you work for some pretty sophisticated clients. Does the, what you just said resonate with those clients? Because if it's not resonating with them, it's going to be much harder to disperse it out uh, to the to the so-called great middle. Um, yes, we do. We work for a lot of clients that are well-resourced. And um, I would say that it's quite variable across the board and in sur surprising ways. You know, that Quaker school we were working for 20, over 20 years ago, and they were already all in on it. You know, world's first lead platinum school we built for them it was in addition to an, an, an original building. So they were all in a long time ago and were willing to put resources at it in ways that some more um, well-heeled institutions, including this one, um, can be reticent about. And uh, so, um, I, you know, I don't know, at the end of the day, it does come down to, you know, first cost a lot. And there's always a balance between how institutions and individuals spend their their money and um you know uh i i would say quite often um in disturb uh, in ways that are kind of disturbing we're still seeing first cost trumping um long-term sustainability so um how to change that i yeah, I don't know how much more urgency, you know, we can create in the world, you know, but I, I do think we could be better economic modelers of all these things in much more comprehensive ways for our clients so that we could help them, you know, 
perhaps make more informed decisions? Should I just build less and, um, you know, save carbon and um, build higher quality buildings that will last longer with lower ongoing maintenance, things like that? I don't think we're professionally doing a great job of helping our clients out on that front. We could be much better educationally. I don't see much attention to it. You know, I got zero education here about the cost of architecture, let alone the cost of keeping it as though it's new across time. I don't suspect that that's changed much now, a lot of years later. It's not good. It's not good, you know, because at the end of the day, it does come down to money and, uh, and there's a lot of competing resources in an educational institution like Penn. I'm not going to argue with somebody who says it should go to financial aid. Absolutely. You know, we're just strapping people with amounts of debt that is not tenable. So you get into these very difficult debates running an institution like this about where do you expend your resources? And um, there's there's no easy ethical answer to them, but but we're not making our best case. That's for sure. I mean, in a landscape, it's it's moving forward to sustainability in the way the maintenance and management. I mean, we're moving towards more low maintenance lawns and less lawn material. We're always thinking about where the extended cost comes in and how do we sustain the open space without the sort of added burden of, of the maintenance and, and materials. Uh, and when we talk about infiltration basins and rain gardens in a historic landscape, they just don't fit. Um, you know, and so we see them here on campus. Like I commented earlier that you have infiltration into the lawns on your walkways that is working and doesn't need to be a rain garden. And it's manageable and sustainable without changing. In a historic landscape, it, it would change the character of the landscape. So we often use subgrading infiltration or we'll take it elsewhere, but we won't necessarily illustrate that this is a sustainable landscape, even though it is. Because the preservation, you know, intent in that particular landscape, particularly if it's interpretation for, you know, an educational purpose, you don't necessarily want to change the character of the place. Right. There's um, an element of sustainability that has its own sort of aesthetic ideas, which sometimes, you know, bring different challenges when we're talking about preservation. Steve, you mentioned ethics, and I think we'll have time just for maybe two more questions from David and me. Um, but I'd like to ask each of you as professionals. Uh, how you think about the kind of ethical codes and obligations to your profession. Um, and I'll, I'll add one that maybe we don't always think about, which is, you know, is there, is there an ethical responsibility to advance the field as an art form? Because ostensibly architecture and landscape architecture are applied arts. And how are those distinct from the values and obligations that are most often central to what we call historic preservation? And one more tack on question, because I can't help it. <laughs> Sorry, Dominique. Um, are are your professional obligations and ethical responsibilities well understood by preservation advocates? You know, how often is that the case? Get this <laughs> <laughs> Um, So the short answer is no. I don't I don't think that preservation advocates understand the full breadth of what the responsibilities are to provide a safe environment for people, which is one of the greatest, you know, charges of an architect. So, so there are, you know, one can make or challenge codes or, you know, FEMA requirements or whatever it might be. There's such, there's such an attachment to the precious. And at my heart, I may provide a safe place for people first. And like, that's actually what matters. And I think there's a disconnect that occurs when we allow the emotions that we associate with a place and the history that we think a place is, which is two things that could spend a whole other hour discussing, um, take over what should be a primary charge of, you know, building as place to keep people safe. So, so understanding landscape preservation, not a chance. <laughs> I mean, you know, you'll talk to people about architectural preservation. They might understand the building has rather static. Landscape, what is that? 
let's, why, why do you have to keep it that specific tree and let's just put a historic fixture, light fixture on the street? You know, so education for the public, bringing forward that that historic landscapes are dynamic and they have a whole cultural realm to sort of satisfy in the urban and rural landscapes. It's a long, it's going to be a longer burden. Well, it's going to take more education, more outreach from our perspective. I mean, there are no regulations that basically guide historic landscapes at a municipal level, at a local level. I mean, we see them at a regional state level, but not at the local towns. You know, preservation landscape architecture in in small cities is up. You know, it's subject, completely subjective. Uh, I don't, you know, ethics today is a word that's tossed about quite a bit, and um, you never quite know what any individual means by it. And to some degree, it's personal for all of us for sure. Um, uh, but as a professional, which we are, you know, we're licensed to do what we do. Um, there, there are some things that aren't personal about it. And to me, if I had to sum it up within my profession at large, um, I, I do believe we have a professional ethic to take care of all that's already here, to be good stewards of it, um, uh, to, to help manage it, to help it give long life. Um, there are all kinds of benefits that we all know about. Um, there are memory benefits. You know, we, we all anchor ourselves to the world through things that are here that are memorable to us. Um, there are clearly ecological benefits across the board. Um, there are global warming benefits. There are, you know, they the, there are cost overall cost benefits. Lots of benefits, but I think that's our ethical obligation. You know, fundamentally, and uh, one of the things I do not like about practice in the U.S. is the fact that there aren't more architects um, working across realms that, that kind of frankly that all professionals in the U.S. don't spend a good bit of their time working on the world that's already here. Um, there are plenty of architects, very prominent ones, some less prominent who just do new buildings, period, you know, and there's so much work that needs to be done. I'm looking at that as not a particularly ethical position frankly, out there. So, um, and we need more dialogue. We need more work in this space. Um, it, there's huge design oppor opportunity in it. I mean, our, you know, uh, when we go into old buildings, part of the ethic is just simply, how can we make this most useful? Because that's what's going to give it its longest life. So what do we have to do? And oftentimes, it's the insertion of a quite a different design ethic than the original artifact almost all the time for our firm um, because that's part of making it relevant for the future oftentimes and uh, so um, you know and whatever arguments you wind up having with clients and people and preservation boards they're all worth it they're all worth it so you so, know just keep going though you so know that, that's and, part so. of the education value yeah we're, we're yeah, educating I, as we go yeah just <laughs> show up and stay true and, um, and put it out there lumps and keep moving on you know but it's it's all worth it so so uh, on the topic of showing up we <laughs> tend to when we initial impulse when thinking we're going to talk about preservation design as well that we're talking about architecture we're talking about landscape architecture we're talking about city planning uh, I might be the policy geek on the faculty here, but the question is, uh, is redesign of uh, redoing of policy is pushing policy forward. That's a design problem too, right? And uh, I mean, many of the stories that you've all told in some ways go back to the way in which policy has intruded on your own professional instincts, uh, your, your, ob your own observations. So who gets to, I think everyone in this room probably suspects that there's some policies that need to be adjusted somehow. Who does that? And is that a design problem? Who gets to do that? 
And is that something that you see as part of the future, the so-called future of preservation design is taking policy as a design problem? <laughs> so the short answer is yes. Okay. I think I think it's the next question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think getting back to this 98%, if there is so I would I would like to see some sort of policy that allows or requires or that encourages, choose your word, people to address the 98%. And it's not in a, a set of, you know, set 10 standards and things that one needs to follow, but it's a path. And I think it's it's much more about the path, the civic engagement piece, the conversation piece, the really analyzing need piece would be wonderful. I don't know how to to make that into a policy, but I think as a a trajectory, it is the best we can do. Um, the preservation task force that David and I worked on a few years ago <laughs> um, started looking at how do we not regulate preservation in the in the door molding, you know, the window molds kind of way, but really look at what are we preserving about the urban fabric of the city that means something on a block by block basis. You know, like how can we save the structure of the row house without being so concerned what kind of window they have? because that's really about the place that people are living and it gives them some level of control over that, that place. But with that can come a structure to say that tearing three of these down and building a, an apartment block is not an acceptable alternative in our place. Yeah, I, I, uh, policy has a huge role in this and I think it's, safe to say a lot of our policies are about 50 years old now that are really governing us. The New York Landmarks Commission was founded right after Penn Station was torn down as a gut response to it, but it, it was really geared at the 1%, frankly. And I think a lot of the policies today are still geared at the 1%. So I, I think the policy discussions ought to be about just, um, and, and that's a role of government. Ours struggles with new policy immensely, but we're actually better than lots of places, so, which we have to remember. But um, it would be, I think, really useful to see policy that, for instance, just gave tax credits, not just to um, historic buildings that can be certified that exist, but give them to retention of, of buildings just because there's value. We're, you know, we're not pumping more carbon out into the world. But so, you know, putting some money and teeth in, um, you know, in the rest of that 98% and trying to encourage um, in the same ways we have landmark conservation, just encourage that more broadly um, would be, I think, a policy direction that would be of huge value. I'm not certain how to change policy. I'm just trying to figure out how to change the perception of what a cultural landscape is. And it's not about seeking keeping the windows it's it's about all the the cultural defining features it's about spatial organization it's about circulation it's about all these sort of characteristics of a landscape that make it valuable so you know when we go forward with with applications we discuss these things as part of the landscape and why they're important not necessarily because they're simply historic they have levels of values across the board so at least bringing awareness and educating the reviewers as to what a cultural landscape is, you know, created by nature and man, it, it is isn't a valuable in and of itself. So how do you define that when you get to a regulatory board? And I think there's still work to do on that because they're still focused on an architectural model, which is very, you know, it's, it's not as dynamic. Great, well, um, we wanna leave uh, time for Q and A. So we have, we have a lightning round question for each of you. Um, and that is that if you were to design what in your mind might be the ideal seminar or or studio topic um, for the, the department here? Um, what would be your topic or your area of focus? Anyone can start. 
<laughs> so um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. So in my ideal, it would be a design problem around one of those 98% buildings where the students actually had to engage with the community and understand what was valuable about that asset to them with a very challenging program that does not allow it to just be restored. You either add to it, you know, clean it out and gut it, do something to it that is not a 1% solution but a 98% solution and being able to have a conversation about it under something like the Secretary of the Interior Standards because eventually those conversations happen in all of our practices. Uh, I guess mine would focus on um, education of architects in the conservation of all the resources that we already have. When I went to school here, this um, uh, program, now department, didn't exist. So uh, I got, I learned nothing here about the preservation of the world that existed. I got it all through work. I work for Denise Scott Brown and Bob Venturi. They renovated this building. You know, they they were doing this stuff a long time ago. Um, and they were just architects. They did everything, you know, and that's kind of how we modeled our firm, do it all. Um, but um, I, I would try to have architects educated, not just preservationists in, how they can intervene in the built world in ways that are designed, that are high design, um, that can be seen as ways of carrying the past forward into the future. And that we're all responsible for it, not just people who call themselves preservationists. So my ideal would be that um, architecture wouldn't exist as a separate discipline preservation wouldn't ex exist as a separate discipline. We would all be required to do all of it. And you can do what Dominique then did afterwards. If you wanna focus in one area, you go do it. But we ought to be educating everybody, landscape as well, <laughs> um, to take care of everything that exists. And that that's grist for great, great design intervention. and. Uh, I remain, um, you, you know, so I think it could be a kind of multidisciplinary studio. That's been the, the model here at Penn, where sometimes architecture gets combined with landscape. Rarely, to my knowledge, does architecture ever get combined with a preservation studio. And that's sad. I could be wrong on that front, but I think it's pretty rare and needs to change. But beyond that, I would just insist that um, everybody in the whole of the planning and design world gets trained and starts thinking about from their educational days onward through their professional lives about their obligations to everything that we've already got. Thanks, Peter. I, I struggled with this a little bit, thinking about it in advance. And, you know, if I were just teach landscape architecture, grading would be where I would go because grading is quintessentially the landscape architect's forte. Uh, but as an outside professional, not coming into preservation from a traditional route, you know, what would intrigue me in a course? And we talk about cultural landscapes as being sustained by culture, society, design, and economy. Now, I don't know how you teach those three things. But those are three things that actually combine, you know, aid us in the preservation, you know, mantra. If you, you know, so there, it's it's I I can't tell you how to teach it. <laughs> I can only tell you they're valuable to the way we actually look at the way we preserve landscapes. Thank you all. Um, I think we have time for some questions. Um, I'm apologizing in advance to those uh, who are watching us through the miracles of the internet, uh, we're not gonna take questions from the chat. Is that right, Micah? So uh, it's up to the people in the room to ask questions and to fill in the, the gaps that we're not gonna have from taking front questions from the chat. That said, if you do have questions uh, that, uh, that you're watching remotely, please send them and we'll do our best to, to, to get in touch with you, one or two more of us uh, to respond to those. And Micah has the 
the mic. I'll be mic running so everyone on Zoom can at least hear us. Fire away, folks. Free time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That's great. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about perspective, just in the sense that you, you obviously, all three of you have uh, have a career that you can look back on. When you think about preservation design, uh, I mean, I was thinking of of Steve's two stories and and how in both cases there's similar reactions, but I'm sure your reaction to those reactions has changed over time. Um, do you think that? The ability to look, I mean, what would you tell your your former self in terms of preparing yourself for becoming a good preservation designer? Well, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a more confident self now, and I have a stronger ethic that I've kind of forged over a lifetime of encounters on this and thought with it. So, um, you know, among those two examples, they were both really difficult. Um, I I went to Yale as an undergraduate. I took Vincent Scully's course on the history of modern architecture before I knew I wanted to be an architect. And um, uh, he, at the event I described, um, came out against this insertion of this balcony. And I was still a fairly young architect, but I stuck to my guns on it and made a really great case for it, I thought, in the room. And, um, um, and uh, you know, w w one of the points I made about America at that particular moment in time, this would have been in the late 90s, was um, that um, we are just more comfortable at the extremes of positions politically and on almost all topics. And when preservation came to the fore in the US in the 60s, it was um, uh, right on the heels of a time where culturally it was, we were just eradicating, wiping out whole swaths of cities with the interstate highway system, didn't matter. And, uh, um, and preservation came on the heels of that post-war movement in a lot of ways. And, I felt like we were just swinging back and forth pos between positions and poles at that point in time. Just, you know, after the war, it was, who cares? We're in America. We're moving forward. Just take it down, move on, build the contemporary world, and let's move on. And the pole of preservation seemed to move in the opposite direction, where it was change nothing, change nothing. So my plea then was simply... <laughs> I, I didn't get educated to learn how to work at the poles of life. I got educated to work, um, to learn how to work in the gray zones in between that required design judgment, ethical judgments, and, um, and ask people to kind of open themselves up from the polar positions to things in between. And, um, you know, that's what I took away from that instance was um, just um be articulate you know stay the course if you believe it's right and you believe it's going to be right for the building you're working with right for the culture that inhabits it you know stay the course um you know 30 years later i'm less patient i think than i was then you know as a young my younger self um about it and find i i have to be more cautious to not just um ever ever be arrogant i'm not an arrogant person but i don't um and i see a lot of it out there in the world i don't like it and so uh, but i find i have to be cautious you know because i feel like we ought to be past this now and we ought to be moving into a world where um we are happy to accept really carefully crafted thoughtful change to the world around us, provided it's making it more useful. And that even if the artifact changes quite a bit, um, if it's still there, that's better than it not being there. 
and sometimes the judgments you know of architects and their clients miss it and go overboard you know in one direction or the other but um i think the danger the bigger danger today lies in not changing history enough not treating it as though it's alive to us and present in our lives and everything we do and allowing it to grow and be reinterpreted for the future to me that's the biggest danger you know i've i've come to kind of a position on over the years um you know the, the folger project ultimately worked out it was a very very close contentious 5-4 decision ultimately by the u.s commission on fine arts and if we hadn't been in the month we went in a collection of new appointees of um and and an not nameable u.s president at the time would have gone the other way so we just got lucky we just got lucky you know and got it through but it was contentious and uh uh you know but uh we weren't backing down from it you know and uh, so um i don't i don't know i mean i'm i'm you know like like i say i i'm not sure what i would have done differently now and then i feel like i'm still pretty much the same ethical person so i'm not sure it would have been different one way or the other just a little different perspective on it over over that interceding 25 30 years we have a, he had another question hi thank you all so much for coming um question um in terms of i was really interested in the like gym into quaker church conversion um, and was curious about your design process for that when adaptively reusing a space. What elements do you choose to preserve and which elements do you choose to not preserve and why? Um, we uh, we preserved a lot of the building, but you'd kind of never know it to look at it today. So we preserved the walls. We preserved the structure of the roof, but resheathed it. And um, we preserved all the foundations and we preserved all the structure. And most of what we did was surgical additions to it. Um, and um, on the outside, um, additions on really wrapped around three sides of the building, uh, all different based on the circumstance in the program. And uh, but carbon wise, we probably saved, and this would have this was far enough back that I'm uh, it was before we had in, had uh, developed tally. Um, but I'm guessing carbon wise, my guess would be we saved more than eighty percent of it probably in that real banal building, and it won an AIA Institute Honor Award. You know, it, so they're really hard to get a handful a year. You know, from a banal gym to that. And um, uh, the, uh, you know, the other tactic in addition to additions outside was new liners inside those walls. And, um, you know, we, we crafted, um, uh, you know, basically a, a high performing acoustical room seating 600 people with no mics who um, get up when they feel like it and say what they want to say and all of them can be heard you know so it's a new insertion within it and um some additions on the outside and um you can still the way we designed it even though the existing building is banal you can trace it everywhere um you know you can you can see it and that's important i don't uh, i'm not a fan of eradicating any cultures or any pests you know, that don't actually um, ultimately for reasons that I can come to accept need to be demolished. So, you know, so um, you can go look at it online, you know, we can get your pictures of it, but it was, it was incredibly satisfying. It's a great project. project. Great project. Yeah. I think alas, we've come to the end of this party, uh, <laughs> which I would love to continue. Um, thank you all for coming and thanks to the panelists.
Uh, it's really been great to have you with us and have your sharing your experience. As I think I'm trying to add up the accumulated experience up here, and it's pretty. It's definitely in the. Please don't quote. I'm no, I'm not going to. So I, I, I'm not the group. I'm not the greatest at adding. So, but thank you all for being here. Um, 